I am Jamie Henry. I am a previous board member for MAMA, and now I uh, i don't know what I should call myself. I think I'm a committee member for uh, the website and some stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to fill in uh, for duties for Amanda Langendorfer, the current president. She is um, in another meeting right now. But I wanted to make sure right off the bat that I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and I'll introduce our panel in a minute. And we're going to be talking about an exciting bicentennial project. But I wanted to thank uh, the Missouri Humanities Council. Uh, they sponsor our workshops and um, do help us do a lot of great work in the state. I also want to shout out Linda Endersby. Um, she is faceless right now, but without her, none of these colleague conversations would happen. Um, I also want to thank the rest of the MAMA board and all the MAMA members for, uh, you know, helping the organization really grow this last year and, and deal with uh, COVID-19 um, in at least one positive way as far as making network and connections um, in the cultural institutions in the state. So with that, uh, as again, I'm Jamie Henry. I work for Missouri State Parks. I am the historic site manager for the first Missouri State Capitol State Historic Site in St. Charles. And today we are going to talk about a collaborative uh, online exhibit and I'm going to introduce our panel. So in no particular order, um, Diane, uh, is it Mutie Burke? Mutie? Mutie Burke is a professor and chair of the history department and director of the Center for Midwestern Studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I am going to cut it off there because uh, I asked them to send me bios because I thought I was going to print them, but then I decided not to. Uh, Sandra uh, Enriquez is an assistant professor of history and the director of public history uh, uh, at UMKC as well. Uh, and then Brian Grubbs is the local history and genealogy manager at the Springfield Green County Library District. Uh, I've known Brian for a couple of years. I recently met Sandra and Diane uh, and the project that they're working on right now is really, I think personally incredible. And I remember having a conversation with Brian during the inception of it years ago at Aris Pizza in Jefferson City. And I was wondering if you were gonna document that as part of the project, but I think we'll talk <laughs> about that later. Um, so just to kind of give a primer before we get into uh, the presentation, uh, this is kind of gonna be a uh, loose panel discussion. We want interaction, so feel free to use the, key in the Q and A function uh, Linda and I will be moderating that. We can ask questions during this or after the fact. And really, we just want people to know about the project, learn a little bit about it, and hopefully get excited. So I'm going to read a brief description. Uh, the Show Me Missouri is a statewide collaborative initiative to document and commemorate Missouri's bicentennial in 2021. The forthcoming digital exhibit will tell the, the story of Missouri and Missourians through the lens of 200 historically and culturally significant objects. Furthermore, the project will examine the comprehensive history of the state through a complex, inclusive, and critical interpretation. Each object will have an interpretive essay that will contextualize it in relation to the larger history of Missouri. Show Me Missouri will be a free and publicly accessible website for the use of scholars, teachers, both K through 12 and collegiate students, and everyday Missourians. The project is a collaborative uh, collaboration between the Center for Midwestern Studies, the UMKC History Department, the Springfield Green County Library District, and Kansas City Public Library. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, Sandra, and Diane to explain what all that means. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to start, start this conversation off by talking just briefly about this idea of commemorating a bicentennial and in particular commemorating Missouri's bicentennial. Um, which I, you know, I think it's an important discussion to have, and I'm sure all of you have been having similar discussions in your various institutions. Um, but, but that really has, has this, this idea of, of bicentennials and how, how you should approach them has, has really served as the foundation for, um, for this project. So I want to begin by very briefly telling you about my, my personal background. I was, I was born in Missouri, received all of my K through 12 education in Missouri public schools. And I did leave Missouri for college and graduate school where I studied um, the American South and Civil War era history more generally. But I spent all of my professional career teaching at the University of Missouri, Kansas City and researching various aspects of the 19th century history of Missouri and the greater region. Um, and in particular, slavery and the, um, the Civil War. So given this, I've 
spent a lot of time pondering Missouri's early history um, and, and thinking about it from a variety of perspectives. And I've long observed, and really honestly, this, this started you know, with me thinking back about how I learned Missouri's history. Um, I've, I've observed that Missourians have often had trouble telling their state story. And I think this is particularly true for the more troubling aspects of our early history. Um, because the bottom line is Missouri's quest for statehood you know, resulted in a national political crisis. The state played a repeated role in the lead up to the Civil War. And of course, the, the region's Civil War era history was, was utterly devastating. And I think Missourians suffered a conflicted regional identity in the aftermath of that war. And so I think that that really difficult past, historical past, complicates efforts to commemorate Missouri's bicentennial. So simply put, how do you celebrate the origins and early history of a state um, that has such a challenging and frankly, I would argue problematic um, history? And I think one solution, sadly, is to engage in, in historical amnesia. So just don't talk about slavery and Missouri's outsized role in the coming of, of the Civil War. Um, you know, I personally believe, and, and that I think is what a lot of people have engaged in. As I've already said, I, I personally think that the, um, that the root of the problem can be found in the state's origin story itself. Um, so this thing that we are in the midst of celebrating, um, the bicentennial of both the state of Missouri and, um, and of Maine. And of course, those two states are forever paired. Um, they, they both gained admission as, as part of a political crisis, a national political crisis, eventually a compromise of sorts. Um, um, over, you know, over this admission of Missouri as a slave state. And I've actually spent some time and, and gotten to know some folks up in Maine um, who, are, who are also commemorating this bicentennial. And of course, they have a really different story to tell, but one that is, is um, forever linked um, to, to the story of, of Missouri. I think most Missourians don't really choose to linger much on that aspect of the story. And um, what is frequently missing in most popular understandings of this event is that the state of Missouri was born at the expense, of course, of indigenous Missourians, which was true for, of course, all states um, who were evicted. And of course, the enslaved Missourians who were doomed to continued bondage. Indeed, um, Slavery was a significant factor in early Missouri history as I've documented. Um, although enslaved Missourians only made up 10% of the state's population in 1860, slavery was central to the economy, society, and politics of the state during the entire pre-war period. Um, and in spite of this, white Missourians, and I think in some cases even today, often distance themselves from slavery and their collective memories um, of the state's history. Of course, some um, over, over the years have adhered to a lost cause version of slavery in which they argue that slavery was somehow milder in Missouri's border location. Um, but some people don't even exist, um, recognize the existence of it at all. Um, in fact, I'm not sure that all Missourians would even know that um, Missouri has this deep um, past that's connected to slavery. Well, some of this could be a legacy of, um, of the embrace of some white Missourians um, of the Confederate past in the years after the Civil War, I think that the relative silence on slavery often stems from a profound discomfort with talking about it or owning up to the state's important relationship to it. Um, contemporary residents of the Missouri-Kansas border reason, region like to boast that the Civil War started in their part of the world, and I would argue that as well. Um, but few Missourians are willing to reckon with the state's troubling role in the expansion of slavery into the West and the sectional political conflict leading up to the Civil War. Indeed, in the years after the Missouri Compromise, Missourians and the Missouri-Kansas border region continue to be front and center in the conflict. So think about bleeding Kansas, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the Dred Scott decision, um, John Brown, um, and um, Lincoln's and Davis's focus on the border states in the first year of the Civil War. In all of these Civil War era events, Missouri, Missourians, you know, played a, 
a pretty negative role. Um, the state's history, I think, is even more tragic when you consider the Civil War years. So Missouri's crossroads location um, resulted in increasingly diverse population with divergent cultural ways in the decades before the war. Um, as a result, Missourians were bitterly divided in their support for the Confederacy and the Union, dooming the state to vicious guerrilla warfare. In the years after the war's end, some Missourians celebrated their role in the conflict, but many others wished to forget this, this nightmare. Um, Missourians viewed the past differently based on their race and ethnicity, of course, as well as their wartime political allegiances and experiences. It was not a past that was easily remembered or shared. Instead, I think some chose to downplay this history, this early history altogether. Um, so don't focus on slavery and the coming of the Civil War, focus on, you know, um, the, the trails west and uh, Mark Twain, for example. This problematic Civil War era legacy echoes still today as Missourians continue to struggle with their state's identity. So all these issues with history and memory, I think are laid bare um, when contrasted with the origin story of Missouri's rival state just across the border to the West. Um, in Kansas, the story seems simple. Um, as they tell it in the land of John Brown, everyone was on the right side of history, fighting to protect the state from slavery. Um, Kansas was literally born out of the crucible of the Civil War. And of course, this historical reality um, of Kansas or the actual historical reality of Kansas is much more complicated and you know, sometimes far less virtuous, especially when it comes to the state's racial history. But even still, Free State Kansas um, is a past that is much easier to celebrate um, than, than the origin story of Missouri. So by contrast, how do you commemorate statehood when the state was born in a compromise over slavery? As a native Missourian, I am happy to celebrate the anniversary of the important mile, milestone um, of, the, of statehood. But as a professional historian, I'm a little bit squeamish about all that that implies. Um, so the only way I can reconcile the problematic nature of this anniversary is to use the bicentennial as an opportunity for contemporary Missourians to, I think, first confront the state's sometimes troubling past. Um, and, and this, in, you know, in particular, the state's role in slavery in the coming of, of the Civil War. So this means accounting for the central part slavery played in the state's origin and the importance of slavery to the early political, social, and economic history of the state. I think, um, you know, it's, it's important for people to understand that, you know, it is true that, that slavery operated on a smaller scale in Missouri, but it was in no, more, um, no way um, benign. But in addition, I hope Missourians can push past acknowledging the state's beginning and instead um, embrace 200 years of the history of the state and its people. And I think the State Historical Society um, under Michael Sweeney's leadership has encouraged communities and you know, museums across the state, historic societies to tell their own stories um, as their contribution to this commemoration of this, this anniversary. And I agree that this is really an appropriate way to approach the bicentennial, but only if these efforts include the stories of the many diverse residents of the state um, and if the history is told in a historically appropriate way. Um, so we need to tell the story of Missouri and Missourians in all its complexity. And this means telling both the difficult stories and the stories that are much easier to celebrate. So really this is the basic principle um, of, of this project that we're working on. This is what is at the root, this idea is at the root of it. Um, so the idea is to tell the, the diverse history of, the, of, of Missouri and its people through 200 objects. And I will admit that I stole this idea um, I had, I had one idea and Brian's gonna tell you he had another idea and then these two ideas merged along the way. Um, but I, I absolutely stole this idea from the Irish Nas National History Museum. I spent a little bit of time in Ireland. I think Brian's gonna pull up a picture. And they have an object-based exhibit that tells the history of Ireland through 100 objects. This is a, was I think probably a much easier project 
for them because they have taken these hundred objects all from one museum. So had, um, you know, I guess the Missouri History Museum in St. Louis done this, they could have drawn all the objects from, from their collection as I'm sure you would recognize that would not be a really comprehensive way to tell the story because it would focus just on, on, on the objects that are in their collection. But this is what the Irish um, Museum did. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool um, online exhibit. So you click on the different objects and it opens up to a little bit more information about the object. And, um, you know, and if you click on the read more, you can find out some some information that will contextualize it in the history. So this was, was my idea. Um, and I mentioned it to Michael and he said, hey, <laughs> Brian Grubbs down in Springfield is thinking about a similar project. You might wanna get in contact with him. And I had worked with, with Brian in the past as a scholar on a couple of his other Civil War related projects. I'd written some things for him. So we at least knew one another. Um, and we decided to meet because I'd already um, twisted Sandra's arm to get her on board with, with this project. And so we, uh, the three of us met in Clinton, Missouri, halfway um, to have a discussion about this. So I'm going to hand it off to Brian and let him tell you a little bit more about his, how he came to this project. Thanks, Diane. Uh, so as Jamie had previously mentioned, uh, we were at a conference, I think the Missouri Conference on History in Jefferson City a couple of years ago, and we had a, a fateful meeting at Eris Pizza <laughs> and over sharing some pizza together, obviously pre-COVID. Um, we were talking about things that we were interested in doing, our respective institutions were doing, and he was telling me about an idea of, for an exhibit that the Missouri State Museum was planning, where they were pulling out objects to display for the bicentennial from their collection that just told little vignettes of Missouri's history. And so we talked about that and I thought that was a, a really amazing idea. And we started talking about how we might be able to expand on it. And a lot of the work that I've been doing uh, in the history field is in the digital realm. And so my first uh, inclination was then to, how could we bring this to the web? And so we started talking and brainstorming some ideas about not only uh, using items from their collection, but could we partner with other institutions across the state to try and identify one or 200 of the most interesting, unique items that we could find uh, across the state that represent various regions, peoples, histories of Missouri over the past 200 years. Whether that was, you know, the first Missouri state flag or a tortoise shell from an extinct animal, um, or Lewis and Clark, one of Lewis and Clark's journals. Whatever those items are, how do they represent our people and the stories of Missouri? And so we started kind of brainstorming this idea, spitballing back and forth over the course of several months. And uh, we really liked it. We thought it had some promise. Uh, and then as Diana had mentioned that Michael Sweeney had been visiting with various institutions and I'm sure many of you about various ideas for the Bicentennial. And so he mentioned to me that Diane was thinking about a similar idea and that we should have some conversation. So uh, we got together, uh, chatted a few times via email and on the phone. And then Sandra, Diane and I got together at Clinton uh, over another lunch as all great ideas are shared over uh, some broken of bread and uh, just kind of hashed out how our two ideas might overlap and how we might be able to work together. And so we started thinking about what their objectives were um, and what my objectives were and, and how, how we might come together with this idea. And I'm gonna let Sandra then talk about how we redefined the two project scopes into one and what we came up with. Yeah, so absolutely. I feel like all great ideas always happen when conversing over food, and it's one of my favorite brainstorming ideas. Uh, but the way that we kind of merged the two projects together was uh, bringing forth the objects themselves to represent the histories of Missouri, but having these uh, uh, interpretive essays serve as kind of you know, the large, telling us a larger historical narrative around it, right? So utilizing these objects as a window to entice people to learn more about the history of the, of the state itself. Um, and so while we were really excited about um, the, 
kind of the, the project that was uh, kind of molding, uh, we began to develop a scope that, you know, understanding that this bicentennial uh, could bring forth very unique opportunities for us to explore the comprehensive uh, history of the state beyond just the statehood moment, right, and utilizing these objects and narratives to really tap into obviously well-known stories of the state, while also not shying away from other uh, from other more obscure uh, histories or very difficult histories that we shy away from. Um, as Diane mentioned, uh, Often, right, commemorating these anniversaries can be very difficult simply because uh, they can romanticize or whitewash history. So we we agreed that um, that collectively as a team, we wanted to create a space uh, where Missourians, not just academics or public historians, but collectively Missourians could refer, reflect on our past, present, and future. So. Uh, as you can see from the, we just put together uh, a kind of a project description and a call for objects, which well, I will uh, I will describe here in a second. But we wanted to make sure that this project was very much very uh, public facing from the get go. Uh, and so we we wanted to make sure as well that this was uh, publicly accessible and free um, that would eventually serve. Uh, not only to create dialogue amongst uh, Missourians, but also to be utilized by K through 12 teachers, um, especially as they, you know, often are in need of 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 historic uh, topics and and documents to include into the classroom. So, for us, uh, you know, we decided to engage in several discussions, not only of like merging, you know, these two project ideas that we had together, but really think about uh, what is happening in the world of public history and digital history altogether. Um, as uh, seen from, you know, earlier, well, it seems since the end, the year that never ends, but uh, over the summer um, with the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, publics, right, and, and, and teachers and students have been demanding more inclusive, uh, more inclusive histories that really reflect the histories of our communities, whether they're painful uh, to, to remember or not. And so we wanted to make sure that this, um, that this project served also as a catalyst for Missouri to really think about how we write history and how we interpret our histories, uh, you know, through objects. Uh, there's uh, the the archivists of the world are very much engaged in reparative work uh, in, in, in current times. So we wanted to make sure too that uh, this, this project served as a way as reparative work and retelling the story of Missouri, uh, um, even if, in those moments of, you know, and the stories and narratives of slavery or racial violence that we shy away from, to ensure that, uh, that we can create a thought-provoking um, and democratic space where people can reflect on the history of the state. Uh, but also to kind of provide the tools in, in, in a way to create a better future. Um, and especially in our current state where, you know, uh, history is needed more than ever, I think that having access to such projects is very important. Um, and so besides the reinterpretive work, we also wanted to make sure that it was collaborative in nature. Um, this obviously stemmed from two ideas kind of being cobbled up together and creating uh, the project, but also making sure that we were uh, collaborative, collaborating with other organizations um, and, um, and, and scholars from across the state. So we recruited the help also of the Kansas City Public Library um, as their digital branch has been doing a lot of uh, digital projects along the way, uh, but we also recruited uh, professors and students from universities across the state. Uh, and we've been collaborating uh, with uh, institutions, historic institutions from uh, Missouri uh, in our call for objects um, effort. So Brian, if you just wanna go to our kind of call for objects thing on the Show Me Missouri page. 
speech yeah. tab. Sorry about that. And I, I'd like to just jump in for a second and add, I mean, we're going to talk a, a little bit more about this in a minute, but obviously COVID has, mm -hmm. has made this uh, work very challenging. But even from the beginning, we wanted for it to be collaborative, especially in the in the um, nomination of objects, but we had all these grand ideas about history harvests and, you know, events and, um, and of course, none of that happened because, because of COVID. So um, we had to multiple times pivot over the course of the past year and, and try to approach things from a little bit different, but different way, but, um, but definitely, you know, wanted to try to get as many people involved as possible. So all that Sandra talk a little yeah. bit more about the objects and I'll talk about the essays here in a second. So once we had, um, go ahead, Brian. So once we had the kind of the overall big idea of what we wanted to do, we collectively curated the themes and topics, right? So we knew that, for example, we were going to have to have several essay and object entries about the Civil War, but we also wanted to make sure to have a more inclusive history. So ensuring that we discuss uh, Native American, the Native American past, ensuring that the history of Missouri went into the 20th and 21st century, uh, ensuring that groups that may not be even considered in having uh, long legacies, uh, historical legacies in this, in this area, um, that they were represented in, in the histories that we were telling. Uh, so for example, I am a scholar of Latino history. So uh, I do know that, that Latinos have had a particularly rich history uh, in Missouri, particularly in the Kansas City area, but their, their stories and narratives are not usually found in the longer histories of the state. So ensuring that, um, that we had a, a good representative history, uh, gender history to be included, LGBTQ history, uh, newer immigrant histories, Etc. And and then this was a collective effort uh, from uh, the the folks that you see here on the screen, but also with conversations with other uh, folks in uh, that are involved in historical discussions. Um, and so we came up with various different topics that you can see uh, on the screen. And then when we decided to uh, put a call for objects. Um, we, we, we send out this call for objects to institutions across the state uh, in late January, early February of 2020, which was a couple of weeks before the world shut down. And this did really throw a wrench in our plan uh, as we understood that, you know, when we uh, were shut down, that uh, folks had been furloughed, uh, people did not have access to their collections. And so we had to continuously postpone uh, the deadline for, uh, for the object submissions. And even so, um, we had uh, reached out to a few organizations who agreed to, um, you know, to nominate objects, but then we lost track and contact with them uh, in the in the process of the shutdown and, and into the remainder of the year. Um, and as we were uh, scrambling to find objects, we also devised creative partnerships uh, with uh, the Missouri State Parks and Jamie has been integral to, uh, to the uh, connecting us with people and objects, uh, you know, across the state uh, with the Missouri Historical Society in St. Louis as well, uh, but smaller organizations like the St. Joseph Museums, like the Jesse James Birthplace Museum, uh, the Missouri Historic Costume and Textile Collection at Mizzou, and many, many others have uh, nominated really great and awesome objects that will help us tell a larger uh, story of the state. Um, it, it, once this this uh, collection, uh, once the exhibit is done, um, I guess we can go to you now, Brian. So you can describe kind of the. Well, I think I was going to talk a little bit about the essays. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I, I meant to say um, you. But but one thing to to add to the whole object um, discovery process, I think we, to be honest, were a little bit naive and and imagining how much was going to come into us. And then it, it became apparent to us, and, and especially because of the COVID situation, which again, Brian will talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes, 
that we just had to go out searching for these objects on our own. We're still doing that, to be honest. And so if, um, as we'll tell you at the end, we'll be happy if there's anything you wanna help us with. Um, but it's been incredibly challenging to try to identify objects because we, we decided on the themes that we felt like were must, must you know, um, or themes that we must, um, must use, stories that we had to tell. Um, and then tried to find objects that would help to tell those, tell those stories. So as far as those interpretive essays, the other thing we decided to do, and we decided this fairly early on, and, and again, it's been a little bit hit and miss because of the COVID situation, because as much as, as museums and historic sites have been disrupted, universities have been as well. Um, so I, reached out to a number of my friends and colleagues from universities throughout the state, people who I knew either taught or researched Missouri history and asked them if they would want to get on board with us um, on this project um, because our idea was to, to ask students to develop the interpretive as a content for, for the project. So, we have partners um, at a number of universities throughout the um, throughout the state, from um, SLU. Um, we have um, from Lindenwood. We uh, University of Missouri, Missouri State. Um, we have folks from Warrensburg, from Rolla, and then you know our own students, Sandra and my uh, my students, who have been working on this project. So we. Um, in a, in a way sort of crowdsourced in, a, in an organized and controlled way, the writing of these essays. And you know that is coming with its own challenge because as you can imagine, some are really great and some need quite a bit of work. And so we're, we're working through that right now. Um, but we thought it would be a really wonderful opportunity for students to have, um, have the chance to get published on, on, a, um, on a website. And, um, you know, so that they can have that for their, you know, future jobs, or if they want to become public historians or whatever it is that they want to do, they would have this, this experience. And, and honestly, they've been pretty excited about it, um, about the idea of, of getting involved in this, in this project. So we, you know, we let them, we gave them choice, a range of choices, um, because we had to tailor lists that we sent out to instructors based on the the scope of the class that they were teaching. So if it was a Missouri history class or it was a civil war class or um, in Sandra's case, a, a um, you know, US um, urban history course. And, um, and then we you know, let them choose uh, what they wanted to work on. So um, that it's worked, I think, pretty well. I mean, there's still quite a bit of work to be done and some essays that ha have not been assigned that, we are, that we'll have to deal with, either write ourselves or find people to write them. Again, you know, if, if anybody's interested, let us know. Um, but it's been, I think, a really wonderful experience for our, our students, but not without challenges because of course, most everybody's on, teaching online. You know, it's a little bit harder to, um, to work closely with students because of that. So, you know, it's, um, it's, we've had our, all had our moments, but it's, it's been, I think, a pretty exciting process for us and for the students. All right, so now I will, I'll, I'll pass it off to you to talk some more about COVID. So uh, once we had our, our, we, we needed to get some funding as well. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, we had identified in that earlier uh, meetings that we had had about who we might be able to approach to help support this project. And we were, are very grateful for our, our, uh, our friends at the Freedoms Frontier National Heritage Area and the Missouri Humanities Council that have provided some support to make this project a reality. Um, and we also went after a grant from the Missouri State Library to develop the project's website. And so we actually received a grant, uh, an, a Library Services and Technology Act grant from the Institution of Museum and Library Services from the Missouri State Library to make this a reality. So thanks to our supporting partners, uh, we were able to move forward. Um, but a lot of that funding came through, as uh, Sandra had mentioned, right as COVID was hitting. And so we had to rethink how we are doing this massive collaborative project in the COVID era and what challenges it brought. Well, first and foremost, we have only met as a team one time. 
that one time in Clinton. Um, other than that, we've met over phone, uh, we've chatted uh, via text and email and had dozens, countless, countless Zoom meetings. Um, and so we as a team have had to adapt our approach. Uh, we also had to think about um, how we were gonna actually accomplish this because as everybody knows, the, the world shut down. Uh, our institutions closed. Uh, institutions had to reprioritize what their goals were, how to just stay open, how to bring people to the public if, if we're allowing people to come into our spaces again. So working on a collaborative project wasn't necessarily on the uh, forefront of everybody's to-do list. <laughs> so we had to readapt our approach. And so we've been working with institutions remotely, obviously, trying to identify things in online catalogs and already previously uh, digitized things that would represent not only the theme, but also of the themes of it that we want to cover with the history, but the, the state as a whole. So we've been adapting, uh, trying to figure out ways in which we want to accomplish our goals while still staying on track to get this project online for the Bicentennial. So we've been working with uh, the website design team. We solicited uh, support from several different institutions across uh, the state and outside the state. All of those meetings have been done remotely as well. And we've been putting together uh, the objects that we found, um, the essays that have been written by the students and the, the professors across the state, and also working with this design team uh, to get some mock-ups ready so that way we can uh, present all this information by later 2021. Sunder, did you want to talk more about the call to objects and some of the things that we found now? Yeah, I realized that we are um, that we are um, we skipped to that. But yeah, so some so we wanted to also make sure that you know our project, uh, while we understood that there were going to be similar uh, projects across the state, like uh, telling the state's history through documents or photographs and images, we wanted to make sure that our object base um, uh, exhibit featured objects that one wouldn't necessarily be uh, featured in, in other exhibits, but that it really uh, captured cool, uh, you know, cool objects that we wouldn't think about as historic objects. So uh, for our entry for or for our essay on river trade, for example, uh, we have uh, the this nomination of the anchor from the Steamboat Arabia uh, to be nominated. So this will be the featured object when we discuss um, when we discuss uh, river trading. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we have a, a, an essay on prominent newspapers, uh, whether, you know, just prominent newspapers statewide and then also uh, on ethnic uh, and black newspapers as well. So we have this nomination from um, uh, from Deutschheim State uh, Historic Site, uh, which was uh, part of this Washington Press, uh, we found out that it was uh, the first news, it was part of the, uh, of the first news, uh, German language newspaper printing in Missouri. Uh, so this would be tied to our prominent newspapers uh, essay. And then you can go to the next one. Um, and if you know much about the uh, World's Fair, uh, the structures from the World's Fair in 1904 um, St. Louis were pretty much demolished in the aftermath. Uh, so the um, Missouri Historical Society uh, has uh, not only certain objects and, and photographs of the event or the, the World's Fair, uh, but this is one of the remaining kind of structures, which is part of the Chinese pavilion uh, from the World's Fair. So this would be featured um, as our object for the World's Fair entry. And then we have many, many other uh, really fascinating objects that have been nominated. Uh, and again, I, I will come back to this here in a second uh, towards the conclusion of the discussion. But, uh, you know, if you have uh, ideas of object nominations from your institutions, we would be more than happy to have you nominate them and include, to include them um, in the project. And I, since you guys are talking about it, I just wanted to jump in real quick. We have two questions from Rachel. Oh, uh, to what extent has religious history been touched on in the project? 
Uh, yeah, um, sorry, I was typing the answer. Oh, uh, okay, feel free to type them then, that's fine. Yeah, so I'll type them, but okay. yes. Oh, Brian, sorry, did you wanna? That's all right, I was curious what the second question was. I didn't oh, see yeah, the questions. The... Uh, the second question is, uh, were there historical interpretation boxes you wanna check within the different object descriptions? For instance, did you want to make sure the Trail of Tears was not only included, but interpreted in a way that reflects the historiographical state of the art? Um, yes, absolutely. So we're 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 making we're hoping to make sure that all of the essays reflect um, up to date historical interpretations of of the event or um, the person we don't as you know if you look at our list we don't have a lot of people because it would be hard to um to focus on individual we we could easily have 200 individual missourians that we could focus on so we've tried to to kind of move away from that idea more and, and, and embed them um embed people obviously i mean we're telling history so it's about people um, but embed some of these um famous missourians into um these different topics but there are some that stand out that we we have to talk about, you know, Harry Truman, for example, and 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 some others. Um, but but yes, I mean, we are we are trying to make sure that we're telling this history in as responsible way as possible, and that's why it's I think been such an excellent partnership with the historians around the state because they're they're the sort of front line, first line. Um, editors on these various essays um, as they've worked with their students to develop them. We've done it in a in a peer review sort of stage process so that they're they're working on the essays over the course of the semester. Um, you know they they've come up with some some pretty pretty solid essays but then there will be a couple more layers of editing on top of that to make sure that all the different elements that we think are important to tell the story are included in the essay. So um, the collaborative process will continue, um, you know, even after the students imagine that their work is done, they will be working some more on this um, to get them to the point where they're ready to be published. And one of the things that we've had to ad adapt uh, for our workflow is in our initial concepts for this project is that we would work to identify where these objects were and then uh, if needs be, have a digitization team from Springfield uh, go out to photograph or scan the items. But obviously that's not uh, a real possibility with COVID. So we've been working to figure out ways around that, which might be that we have uh, photography and scanning guidelines that we've developed and we have been working with institutions to meet those guidelines and then submit the digital images to us. So that way we can limit exposure of uh, individuals traveling across the state to still accomplish those goals. Um, and so it also helps with uh, not only the exposure, but also the turnaround time. Um, and we're not asking for any physical donations of items, right? We're just needing to use uh, digital representations, the digital surrogates of these objects. And as always, proper citation and credit will be given to each institution because we wanna not only explore the history of Missouri, but encourage the people that are going to the site to discover these objects in themselves once everybody is safe to go out into the public again, visit the museums and discover more within each of our collections. Um, yeah. Sorry, oh. I just wanted to ask if you can see the answers to the written um, to the written questions. If not, I'd be happy to kind of answer them. Um, so what everybody has to do is if you kind of mouse over the screen, the bar that pops up at the bottom, there should be a Q&A that you can click on and that'll pull up a little um, screen. And up at the top, there are going to be tabs at the top of the box that pops up. One will say open, one will say answered. And so you'll click on theirs to navigate them. And so if you don't see any questions in the open tab, you'll see answered and then four in parentheses. So you'll click on the answered in four, and then you'll be able to scroll through the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... 
Go ahead, okay. Diane. Oh, I was just going to say, just to, to add to what you j just said, I mean, part of the reason why we wanted to to work with established museums and historical societies and various other um, humanities-based um, you know, entities throughout the state is that we thought that we would have a better chance of, of well, hopefully knowing you know, more about these objects and um, knowing whether they really were produced in Missouri or they were used by Missourians. I mean, all of that, you know, it was kind of a line of defense in that, um, that way to know that these objects are authentic. Um, but to add to what, what Brian said, there are other hope is that, um, you know, once this pandemic is, is over, um, that people will be happy and excited to get back out into the state um, and that, you know, viewing these objects on this website will be a way to drive people to your, um, to your institution so that they can actually see um, the particular objects and other objects in, in person. And so the idea will be to, to link directly to the websites for your, um, for your institutions. Um, if you have um, virtual tours, you know, you develop them through Clio or some other, um, you know, some other platform um, that you would like for us to link to. I mean, you know, we're happy to do any of that because we really want for this effort to be a best use and benefit to um, to everyone, um, to, to the people of, of the state of Missouri, but also to the wonderful institutions that tell the history of Missouri that are scattered throughout the state. So Ethan asked a great question, which was uh, with so many great objects that we found, uh, have we had uh, discussions about expanding those numbers? Um, and are we planning or are we planning on sticking with that original number? And the, the answer to that question is that for the bicentennial, we're doing this project for the bicentennial, but it's not necessarily a bicentennial project. And what I mean by that is we're wanting to launch in the bicentennial bicentennial year to witness and commemorate uh, the Missouri's bicentennial, but we're hoping and our plan is to keep this project going forward in the future. So we, our goal is to continually add to this project, adding more objects, more essays, more narrative, and letting this be a living project um, for, uh, for the state. And as we develop new partnerships, as we find new items, continuing to add things. So one of the things that we wanted to do was share some of the, the early concepts of our site's outline, but I'm, let's see if this is gonna work. Oh, yes. So this is very, very early concept. Obviously it's just a, a blank te a template, but it might give you a little bit of idea. I actually have a note from our web development team that uh, on Friday, I have mock-ups and user interfaces ready to go to display to us. So if we would have done this presentation next week, you would have seen a lot more. Um, but in between this stage and where we'd be next week, we've looked at many different online uh, websites, different galleries, um, selected color palettes, user experiences, things that we would like um, that we want to incorporate into our site. But this is the very core skeleton structure of the site. And so you'll have a landing page in which we'll have a rotation of featured objects um, and down below a link to the history of Missouri's Bicentennial, why it's important, what we're hoping to do with this project, um, participating information uh, from different organizations and links to some featured essays. There'll be several call to actions throughout this page um, where you can then click on uh, to view the collection or view the essays. On the collection level, there'll be uh, a carousel of different objects and, uh, that you can then sort in different uh, manners such as geographic location, chronological, alphabetical, um, all sorts of different ways to discover the content. You'll then be able to click on these and then see a carousel of different images of that object. We can incorporate video, three-dimensional models uh, where you can view the object in uh, 360 degrees, uh, different still image angles, and then some brief description about what that object is and links to the larger historical essays that that object represents, as well as different uh, places. There'll be embedded maps of where the object lives permanently 
the users will be able to click on and will give directions and contact information to those host institutions. You'll have different categorical tags such as um, military or agriculture or higher level tags that you can then click on, which will pull up all the objects that are, have been uh, tagged with that category. And then other related objects down here as well in the carousel. You'll then be able to click on the related essay and it'll jump to directly to the essay level. It'll have uh, the author or co-editor's names, the title of the essay, and a longer description about the, the history of that topic, along with embedded images related to there. So again, this is really early uh, concepts of what the site will look like. Um, there's no color palette or anything like that. Obviously, it's just some very high level user uh, experiences, um, but we're excited about where we're gonna go uh, with this project and how we'll be able to engage with the public uh, through, through these objects and tell the history of, of Missouri. Well, and the idea is to be able to, um, to add supporting materials. So, um, you know, perhaps related objects, but documents, um, you know, I, I mean, the, well, it'll be built out over time. So we may not have all of that, you know, when this thing goes live in August next year, but, you know, over time there will be more and more uh, materials that will be added to each of these essays. So Sandra, would you like to talk about um, how others can get involved with the project? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like we said, you know, because COVID has thrown a wrench in our plans, as you know, I'm sure for everyone else uh, on this on this webinar, um, we are somewhat behind in, to where we want to be at this moment. So we do have, although we have kind of partnered with well, not kind of, we have partnered with uh, professors and their students to help us write a lot of the content for uh, the essays. Uh, we're still missing objects and uh, we are in need of authors who would like to author a piece uh, for the website. Uh, and if you're interested in authoring an essay or submitting a uh, an object nomination, you can do so uh, through a variety of ways. I'll go through the object submission first. Uh, so if you go to midwest.umkc.edu, uh, you would see the Show Me Missouri tab at the very right hand side of your screen and you can nominate an object uh, through the portal there uh, and it will take you to a Google form where you can click there uh, and that would be, um, you know, sent to us automatically. Uh, you know, you, it, even though it says August to 2020 in our deadline on the website, uh, we're still taking, uh, we're still taking nominations if you choose to. And we just ask you a few brief questions, like tell us a little bit about the object that you're nominating uh, and just to attach a photograph if you're able to. Um, so that would be to do the object nomination. Uh, and then if you're interested to know about what uh, essays still need authors, or if you would like to suggest a, a topic uh, that you do not see reflected uh, in, the, um, in the themes and topics list on the website, uh, you, know, you can email us and we will obviously uh, consider uh, your, your suggestion and here are our emails. Uh, but yes, and we would be happy to share a list of, of topics that still need authors. Um, we just thought that kind of bombarding you uh, through PowerPoint and putting them all up on the screen would be a little much uh, for this brief presentation, but we would be happy to, uh, you know, to share that information with you if you're, if you're interested in, in, in authoring or collaborating with us in this. In well, this the, the list has, has, um changed a little bit from that sort of general list that we, you know, we, we built out a much longer list and come up with 200 objects. And I see this question about next year, 2022, no, <laughs> 2021. Yeah. Um, so we are, we are racing against the clock here. Um, you know, I think that we know that, well, I mean, at the very least, we want to have the 200 objects and the, um, 
object descriptions all up there. Hopefully we'll have as many of those essays written as possible. But the way that this is, that we were staging this is that the, um, the design team is, is building the framework for this website and then Brian and his, his team will insert, you know, so it's, it's gonna be a situation where they can keep moving stuff into the, to the site over time. So we are working pretty frantically to um, have as much of this content in hand by the end of the spring so that we can start populating the website. Um, but we wanna have something um, you know, that's pretty solid that we can premiere, um, you know, at the, at the point of the, the official statehood date in, in August of this year. I think that we were all perpetually stuck in 2020, sadly. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, but um, I do see that uh, Ethan is asking if we could mention like one or two objects or artifacts that we come across that are our favorite. Uh, that we're particularly excited to feature in this project? Well, I'll mention one. It's, it's a troubling object, but because of what I do, I think it's, it's really intriguing, is that we're going to feature the wooden money box um, that was used at Lynch's slave pen in, in St. Louis, um, you know, which was one of the, you know, um, you know, a site of, of the sale of, of, you know, hundreds of people over the years. So I think that's a, a, a stark, um, but really um, important, important object. Others have I, favorites? Perhaps my favorite, and this is uh, something that I'm also very personally excited about. Um, they're in the early, late summer, early fall of 1953 in Springfield, Missouri, there were 10 uh, Indian Cobras found in the city. Uh, it, the event was called the Cobra Scare of 53. And so Drury University has the only known surviving uh, Cobra preserved in formaldehyde in their biology department. So we'll be including that story and that object in the website. Yeah, so we have some fun stuff as, as, as well as some, you know, horrifying stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 For me, there's two objects that we uh, found uh, from the Missouri Historical Society. Uh, one of them is a knife sharpening cart that belonged to an Italian immigrant in St. Louis. And he uh, created, I don't recall the name of the, of, of the gentleman off the top of my head right now, but he, um, utilized that cart and walked around, um, you know, St. Louis sharpening. It was kind of like his own, like, business, uh, until he retired. And so it's, he kind of, Device this cart himself. So he kind of, you know, missed an opportunity, I guess, to trademark uh, the, this vehicle. Uh, and the second one, um, the we have a uniform, a nurse's uniform from Homer G. Phillips, which was a segregated hospital in St. Louis. Uh, and it, be, it was the largest, I believe, uh, segregated uh, training hospital in the country at one point. And so uh, having a particular uniform that belonged to a nurse that's going to be featured in our in our essay discussing segregated hospitals I think is really exciting as well. Yeah there's some cool civil war objects and mm -hmm. um, we got a lot of submissions of civil war objects I, I will say. Um, so I just I wanted to it's uh, 2 30 um, so we can go a little bit longer but uh, I didn't want to keep but there's a couple questions in the, in the chat did you answer Rachel's follow-up question um oh uh, not yet but okay. yeah we go ahead oh sorry and if you wanted to type it feel free to type it too yeah which, which question was the one that uh the first follow one follow up on religion um yeah yeah and so we 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 are um we have quite a few essays about religion so um catholicism as sandra says um mormons and the mormon war we are, are trying to um, 
develop essays about various religions that um, religious sects that that were founded here in Missouri and we haven't really gotten very far with finding artifacts for any of that we you know we're interested obviously in, in country churches um, you know so there there are a lot of different ways that we're talking about religion in, in various essays um, and we have a few questions about objects that we're still seeking um, and to uh, kind of put Holly's uh, question and Mary Beth's question, uh, indigenous uh, peoples' uh, objects, especially uh, from, uh, we've been trying to uh, get in contact with the Trail of Tears uh, just to make sure that we have a representation, not necessarily from, uh, you know, not a a map of the of the of the trail itself, but rather something from the from an indigenous group um, as well. So we we are missing uh, certain uh, objects when it comes to indigenous people. Yeah, we, we've struggled a little bit with that. I you know we're trying to we well we have a lot of documents, mm -hmm. but we're we're trying to privilege objects over documents and use the documents as supporting materials. But in some cases we just can't find an object that, um, that represents whatever story we're trying to tell. So um, there have been lots of challenges in trying to identify these objects. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a, a canoe that was submitted and I don't mm -hmm. remember which tribe that was from. Osage. Top of my head, the Osage. And mm -hmm. then there's also, I think the Missouri Historical Society had um, a fur traders ax mm -hmm. of some sort as well. Um, and there are a couple of other pieces. Uh, Heidi asks if we have an object related to the Pony Express, which that's something we are looking for. Yeah, we are, yes. Um, the Major's House has, um, you know, the sort of mail bags, but they're reproduction. Mm -hmm. So we, we're trying also not to use reproductions if, if possible. Um, and then the other two questions there from Holly uh, for the Missouri site tours and then a list of existing nominations. I'm, I'm guessing that you would just rather them reach out to you in email and then you can supply that information because I don't think you have a list of existing nominations on the website right now, right? We don't have a list of, of the topics that we have covered on the website currently, no. We do have a list of topics that we still need objects and authors for. So right. uh, the reverse might be the better way to go about that. And we'd be happy to email that out to the group. Yeah, absolutely. So on the topics, we may, it may be a few days because we're in the process of working with the, the professors at the various universities for them to give us their assessment of the various essays and not everybody has, has finished that work yet. Um, but as soon as they do, then we'll have a really good idea of, of the essays. I mean, we know the essays that have never had an author, but we, we know that there will also be some essays that, that either you know, the student failed to get the work done or it was just not very um, good quality um, and we'll need to reassign those. And the, the other thing that, that we failed to mention is we do have some graduate students at UMKC who have been working with us on this, as well as an undergraduate intern who will start this spring. So we do have some other um, help. It's not just the three of us. And I don't think we ever, we ever made that point. Um, but we, um, you know, are happy for any help anybody feels compelled to give us, um, because it, there are a lot of essays that we still have to write. Yeah, and sorry. Yeah, we, we have, uh, there's still some a lot to write and to answer also right uh, Riley's question uh, we have uh, some of our objects are actual sites as well so we should have said that we're not just necessarily looking at small objects but we are also considering uh, buildings historic sites um, and also things like you know we're taking uh, we're speaking about object broadly uh, to also include uh, oral histories or um, um, videos. music, videos, art. Uh, photographs, et music, art, yeah, all of that. Or you know, we're going to use a, a bison, for example. Yeah, yeah um, we're using all bison. sorts of different media types yeah. in this project, yeah. and we're not limited by any format. And I guess that's the other thing to point out is we say 200 years of history, but we are we are moving in back in time. 
um, to the pre-statehood -state periods and, and obviously even, um, you know, histories of indigenous peoples. We, we've got um, some, um, you know, we're talking about prairies and we're talking, you know, so we're talking about like the landscape and, you know, there are essays about a number of different things that are not even, you know, that are natural world. Um, because obviously that's really important as well. So we're, we're defining this pretty broadly. Uh, so I don't see any other questions and I really appreciate you guys doing all this. Um, the emails are up on the screen. So feel free to write those down and I'm, uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn saying that you'd love to hear from everybody uh, that has any ideas. Yes. Um, and then uh, if, if there is uh, a request for it, we can always do a follow up for this once the website goes live so that we mm -hmm. can actually show that off and have another discussion because I, I think the part that I like most about this project, um, you know, from from like a, a conceptual idea is that it, it is a, like a sustainable thing where it's going to continue to build and build and build. Um, so with that, I, I'll close this. I'll be on the lookout for more colleague conversations in the future. And I want to thank our panelists and all of our um, participants joining us today. Uh, like I said, this is, I'm just so absolutely blown away with this project and I can't wait to see it uh, when we get to see the website go up and, and see all the essays and, and things that have been done. Well, thank you. Thanks for all your help. Yeah, um, thank you, Jamie. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Yes, thank you everyone.